Hello and welcome to the Friday, December 1st, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Augusta, Georgia. Brad today has a nice write-up telling you what the Emotet malware has been up to recently. This particular malware family has been a more or less a consistent presence over the last few months. Anti-malware like Windows Defender, for example, as Pratt points out, is doing a pretty good job in identifying it now. Also, according to Pratt, recent samples haven't really been able to fully infect Windows 10. However, if you're still using Windows 7, you may be more susceptible to this type of malware. So short lesson here, keep your system up to date, keep some reasonable anti-malware enabled, and these sort of everyday threats should pretty much be dealt with. Brad currently finds Emotet mostly in these invoice spam emails, which uh, many users now are able to correctly identify. But then again, remember the holiday season is coming up. And with that, a lot of users, for example, tend to be more susceptible to things like fake shipping notifications or notifications about shipping delays. So I would look out for malware taking advantage of uh, these uh, type of lures. And starting July next year, Google Chrome may limit how third-party software is allowed to interact with Chrome. Up to now, third-party software was able to inject its own code into Chrome in order to, for example, manipulate how web pages are being displayed. There are sort of two important groups of software that legitimately use this feature. First of all, accessibility software, but then also anti-malware software. Turns out that users of such software experienced significantly more crashes of Google Chrome. So what Google is going to do is that they're going to push these particular pieces of software to alternative ways to interact with Chrome. It's no longer really necessary for the software to do to inject its own code, which appears to be the part that really causes most of these problems. There will be exceptions if the software is signed by Microsoft, for example, then it will still be allowed to do what it's doing now. Also, some accessibility software may remain able to do this kind of code injection. Over the years, there have also actually been a couple of cases where anti-malware software due to buggy implementations of uh, this particular interaction did introduce additional security holes in Google Chrome. And the European Union's free and open source software auditing project is trying something new. And now this particular initiative by the European Union did an audit of a number of open source project. And now they're sort of going the next step in starting to offer bug bounty. The first test here is VLC, the very popular open source video player. The bug Bounty is run via the Hacker One platform and bounties range from 100 to 3000 euro. There have been a number of similar projects where companies like Google, for example, did fund bug bounties for open source projects. I believe this is the first time where actually a government organization steps forward in order to provide the funding for such a challenge. Well, it's uh, Friday again, and today I got another STI student after uh, taking a break here with these interviews. Uh, today with me, I have uh, Scott Perry. Scott, uh, can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the research you did as part of the STI program? Yeah, thank you, sir. Appreciate being on the podcast. I'm a big fan. I've been in the SANS SDI MSISE program for about two years now. I actually just finished up Management 525 at SANS Pentest Hackfest uh, earlier this week. Just a really great experience. Really, I've really enjoyed the program so far. And uh, this paper kind of highlights the program in that it's, it's really kind of pushed me outside of my comfort zone. Uh, I currently work as a computer network forensics investigations uh, for the federal government. And, you know, I can read hex and packets and that kind of stuff, but 
this program has allowed me to kind of branch out into red team, blue team activities, uh, really delve into some of the security. And I kind of wanted to, with this research paper, add something to the community. Um, you know, I, I typically, when I go out and do incident response, you know, we'll, we need to image a server and we'll show up on scene and we try to do our homework where possible, you know, domain tools, um, try to get intel on the site if it's an outside entity, um, if it's a, a bad actor, I should say. And, but we don't always know what we're rolling up into. So, you know, typically we will, we do encounter VMware and ESXi servers. So uh, your paper mostly dealt uh, with VMware and how to do sort of forensics in a virtual environment. Can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you typically run into in a virtual environment? We've been, <laughs> we run into a lot of different types of servers. With the virtualized environment, you know, we, we, we don't really know what's where. I'm talking in particular with a, a search warrant type environment where you have no idea what the network looks like. A lot of times the staff is cleared out so you can conduct your search and you are just trying to figure out what's where and how's it functioning. So in a virtualized environment, you may have a, a virtualized NAS, uh, SAHAN, whatever it may be, you know, data somewhere else, data up in the cloud, and traditional forensics of just powering down a server or a computer and yanking out drives and imaging them on site just don't really cut it nowadays. Um, so I, I wanted to write this paper based on previous research, some SANS blogs, some, some books that were published a while ago, and kind of update the material and do some testing to kind of show what's possible. You know, a lot of times we go in and we, we got, say, a portable NAS that has a 10 gig card. Well, you may naturally assume, okay, well, we're going to plug in 10 gig Ethernet and it's going to go faster than 1 gig Ethernet, but some of my testing kind of shown that was not the case. And I, I wanted to kind of add that to the updated step-by-step -step guide. Yeah, I thought it was sort of an interesting uh, observation here that really the network speed it didn't help much. You think that's uh, because of the PCI bus is really maxed out or, or the drives? Because I think even with SSDs, you didn't really see much of an improvement going from 1 to 10 gig, or? That's correct, and, and that's kind of what my testing showed. Uh, I, I, I thought that would be the case, but, you know, you're on scene, you're trying to do things as fast as you can because everybody's waiting on you because the, the forensics always takes the longest time. And I, I wanted to kind of get a, a good benchmark where I could provide it to the community and say, okay, you're acquiring this type of server. This is kind of hardware you might encounter. And this is where it would rate speed-wise to kind of give you an estimate of how long it's going to take you. Now, in normal sort of um, hardware-based forensics, uh, to call it this way, when you sort of uh, look at media like this and even you know, try to exploit what's on the media, uh, that's typically a fairly disruptive process. You have to remove hard drives from servers. In a virtual environment, is some of this actually a little bit easier or less disruptive? Like when you go into an environment like this, uh, do you just uh, copy and analyze the particular server, the, the virtual system or do you actually try to acquire the entire host? It really depends on the case and the investigation. Nine times out of ten we're, we are copying the entire server but we're seeing such larger and larger data sets we really have to start to do the quote-unquote laser forensics and really focus in on exactly what we want. You know we, we, we talk to the investigator running okay, what do you need? What will help out your case? And, and it's, is it just email? Okay, we'll just get the email server. We don't need the file server and the SQL database and everything else that's really not going to help the case. So it, it, it kind of goes back and forth. Um, you know, if you get 20 terabytes on a, uh, on a search warrant, you're taking an evidence, it really doesn't help you out if it's going to take you two years to go through that data. So we, it, with all possible, we, we try to get that VM, but we still have times where we're going to take down the whole server. And it's, it, it, sorry, it doesn't really answer your question, but it, it's, 
it is kind of back and forth, but we try to get that one VM or that two VMs that really help the case. So the balance is really when you have all the data, then you also have to analyze it. You have to maintain the integrity of the data. So more data is certainly not always better. That's correct. So that's what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's correct. Yeah. Now, when I read your paper, um, I'm sort of myself more blue team defensive guy. And uh, one thing I was thinking about is that uh, lately I've seen some incidents where the bad guys were using sort of techniques similar to what you describe in terms of breaking into virtual infrastructures and then downloading servers. We always used to joke that you know, servers don't get stolen out of the data center, that uh, typically your physical security controls are pretty good in a data center to prevent that. But with virtualized environments, having an entire server, including hard disks, memory and everything stolen, is certainly possible. Any sort of lessons on how to make that more difficult that sort of came out of your paper? Um, I guess from your point of view, it will almost be an anti-forensics to make it more difficult to find these systems. Um, not really for this particular paper. My previous paper I did on the uh, CIS critical security controls and applying that to a digital forensics incident response lab network and really applying those critical security controls will help mitigate a lot of this, um, a lot of those risks and uh, the ability for attackers to get into your system. And that coupled with uh, continuous monitoring throughout the network, not just at egress points, I think will also help. Um, and, and encryption at rest, you know, employing that encryption at rest really does prevent a lot of that uh, exfiltration of data. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and uh, not just thinking back about the incidents that I've seen, uh, it was really for the most part sort of default passwords and such how a bad guy got into a virtual environment like this, shared passwords and such. So it wasn't really an exploit uh, to break out of a virtual machine or, or anything along those lines. Yeah. That's correct. Now, there was uh, one little tidbit in your paper that sort of caught my attention, and uh, you sort of go over the steps and how to set up the environment before you sort of acquire the data. And one thing you mentioned is uh, that uh, during the investigation, the uh, closed circuit TV, the, the video recording uh, that may be happening inside a data center like this should be turned off. Uh, any reason why you sort of prefer that or why that should be the case? We generally consider that a, a standard operating procedure uh, just from a personnel safety standpoint. You know, we obviously strive to, like, let's say we go into a, a business. You know, we try to more or less take that business offline from the Internet so there's no remote access. Uh, that's also once you uh, declare an incident and you're doing mitigation, uh, you know, obviously the attacker is going to know you're in there. So we try to we try to cut that off at the, at the Internet pipe. But to actually take the closed circuit TV offline, uh, usually that's a, a good piece of evidence as well. But more and more, that CCTV is also Internet based and it can be viewed remotely. So typically we will we'll take that offline just for personnel safety, knowing who's on scene, doing what, uh, not not to hide ourselves at all, but just to collect that evidence as well. So that's kind of a rationale behind that. So the, the reasoning here, and that's actually quite interesting, is that essentially you don't want the bad guys watching you as you're doing your investigation. That's correct. Yeah, uh, real, real great uh, insight here. And uh, thanks uh, for joining me. Anything you're working on right now, any additional papers or any projects we should be watching out for? Um, I'm actually working on my presentations for the STI program. I'd like to expand this research. I wanted to initially include uh, Hyper-V as well. Uh, I probably will not do that for my presentation, but I'd like to explore the possibility of using Power CLI uh, in acquisitions as well as um, doing some additional testing with other media. Well, great, and uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, for everybody listening, I will add links uh, to the paper, actually both papers in the show notes. That's it for today, and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.